The Gospel of John, chapter 15, beginning on the first verse. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. And as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you want, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. And as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is the word of the Lord. Lord. Heavenly Father, we give you praise and glory because you watch and care over us. We declare your goodness and we rest in your work. In Christ Jesus alone, amen. You may be seated. I'm grateful to be here with the brothers and sisters. Um, I've had the privilege to meet Pastor LaBelle uh, through the life of Tony and uh, the Smiths that they attend here also that told me a lot about him. And um, we've gotten to meet their family and have some time of fellowship. And I am learning much from your pastor, church. You know, I'm grateful um, it's only been about a year or so that I've been pastoring Church of the Redeemer. Uh, Pastor John Paul moved to Virginia. So it's been a, a great uh, learning curve for me. And I am grateful that I have Brother James LaBelle here and that I can trust and, and grow with you. Amen. And I'm privileged and honored to be here with you this morning. Um, we find ourselves in the Gospel of John. Which, um, at Church of Redeemer, we've been going through the Gospel of John for about... Almost two years, I think, right now, about a year and a half, and we're coming through that. We've gone through this section, and it's amazing to see what the Lord has assured us, right? It's amazing to see what He has given to us, and in the Word that has been written, in the Word that He has written upon the tablets of our hearts, in the calling us out of sin into life, causing us to be born again, and all the deposit that He has given us. And sometimes we, ourselves, Christians, right, we, we have a tendency to forget that this is all a gift of God. This is all a, a true provision. I can't add to it. And even if I try, this is the glorious thing. Even if I try to take away from it, I can't. This is my sure standing. That what God has done, it is he who has done it. What he has declared, it's he who has declared it. And I can trust that and I can rest in that. In the midst of all the ups and downs of my life, in the midst of the comings of the seasons, right? The, when things are still and calm and, and good, I can trust in him. But especially in those hours of darkness, right? In, the, in those moments where things aren't so well. Even then, I need his word. I need to abide in him. And... As we find ourselves, this is a moment that's very intimate. Jesus is not talking here to the crowds. He's talking to those he has called out of the crowds to himself. He is called, this is the, the Gospel of John spends this last, the 50% of it in those last moments, that last week, those last hours of Christ. Here we know he's washed the feet of the disciple. Judas has already gone to do quickly that which he was set to do. And here the Lord is caring for those that he has near him. And he has registered these words. He has given us these words to know that he's caring for us even to this day. And we find here this great declaration. I am the true vine. and My father is the vine dresser. This is something that we have to really 
embrace and grasp, well, we confess the, the, the mystery of godliness, the Trinity. We know God as the one true God. And we confess the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, this, this mystery. And here Jesus is showing there, there is this distinction, but yet this unity. He is the true vine. And the Father is the vine dresser. The image of the vine, right? This was given in the Old Testament to Israel. And we could see this dimly. And this is the thing that's amazing. Um, I had an experience this past week. I, I've been blessed to have six children, you know, three boys and three girls. Tiffany's here with me today. Um, our two-year-old, Alethea, she's not doing too well, and eight, and so Christy stayed home with them. And um, Liam, my six-year-old, seven-year-old now, he got a, bin a binocular, and I was trying to use it. I, I don't have my left eye, so I, can, I have one good eye, and I let my kids know that. Um, and I'm, I'm watching this, and you have to focus it, right? And, and this is the truth of the gospel, Right? Life and history, it, we see things almost as in the dim light, unfocused. But as soon as you hear the voice of God and you're called in Christ, all things past, present, and future are made clear in the person of Jesus Christ. Suddenly we can see him clearly. And this is a miracle. It's a wonder. I mean, suddenly, think of this, brothers and sisters. Suddenly there was a day in you, and I pray God every single day this reality is happening in us, Repentance. I mean, it is, it is a gift of God. You know, in, in listening, uh, I mean, I know that maybe this liturgy is, is, is old to some of you, but this liturgy is new to me. And I love it. You know, to, to, to really take every moment and focus in the richness and in the wealth of God and in our poverty. And we who are nothing, He has done everything to reach us and not to leave us but to restore us and to never, never leave us nor forsake us but be with us to the consummation of the ages. When all things come together, we will see him more and more clearly. But that is given to us here and now, to have this hope here and now. This is the truth of eternal life, what John is later on going to say, and this is eternal life, that you may know God as the one true God not all the makings and the trickings that kind of creep into our heart and the deceptions that fill up our minds and the idols that we attempt to create and make our own, but the one true God. And this one true God is not fixed in my imagination or in the abstract of my thoughts, but it's fixed in the Son, given to me fully in Jesus Christ, me to Him and Him to me. And this is the beautiful thing that now that I am in Christ and Christ is in me, you and I are bound in him. Nothing can tear us asunder. For nothing can tear us asunder from God. And here, he's unveiling this to them. I am the true vine. Nothing else suffices. Nothing else. If you look to anywhere else, if you trust in anything else, if you get caught up with anything else, praise be to God that eventually that else will run dry. That is a mercy of God. And there, in that moment, you will understand and you will know what it means to be brought into and, and, and crafted into the true vine. And Christ is assuring this, not just in him, but in my father, the vine dresser. Who is this vine dresser? One thing that um, the, the term vine dresser, it can mean the farmer or one who tills the earth. Right? Or the keeper of the vineyard. So when I read that and I thought about that, this brings us all the way back right, to the one who created Adam from the dust of the earth and blew in his nostrils the breath of life. And that man came, became a living soul. These are the little things that because we read them so quickly, right, or it's, we're accustomed to it. It's Genesis. It's the... Right, everybody in the beginning of the year, right? they say, I'm going to read the Bible through the whole year. And you start with Genesis and you finish. You read that over and over and over again. And then by the time you get in Leviticus, you're lost. And we get used to it, but we don't think of this miracle, this wonder. That God, the creator who spoke all things into being, shaped man from the dust of the earth, blew in his nostrils the breath of life, and that man became a living soul. And then 
by the grace of God, without man earning anything, being able to earn anything, God places him as the one that would keep the garden of God's delight. That's not grace. Tell me what it is. And you see, those are things that are pointing to the fulfillment of all of it, of Christ Jesus, the one true man, the true keeper. And here, so this brings me back to seeing that there's nothing here happening that is outside of God's sovereign control. He knows well who you are. He knows exactly where you are and the means to take you all for himself. His Father is the vine dresser. Our God is the vine dresser. And Jesus says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. This is the desire of the Father to see his vineyard well. The desire of the Father is to look upon us. And this is the thing that, this is that great struggle in our souls. I don't know about you, but I know about myself. And I know the ups and downs of my heart. I know the struggles that are in me. And if I am not to turn to Christ and look to him and fix my gaze upon him and know that it is from him that all my strength comes from, that it is from him alone, that all my source is given, I am weakened. Right? And, and if, I, if I'm not constantly fixing my gaze upon him and thanking him and, and, and being grateful to him for the wealth of his care towards me, it's, it's almost like a flood for the things that try to, to push him out, push out the truths that we know and hold so dear. But yet the Father will prune us. He will cut us so that we may bear more fruit. That's why James could say, consider it pure joy when trials and tribulations come your way. Consider it pure joy and and we have this if we are not zealous to keep ourselves in the means and and by the means of what Christ and God has trusted into us and if it's not the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit doing this constant work of sanctification in us we would uh, run a mess and he wills to bear more fruit, to, to have us bring about more fruit. And, it's, and this is the language of Christ unto us. This isn't my imagining what this more fruit can be like. You know, the reading of Scripture from the, from the, the service there, we, we had it from Galatians. And it's, it's clear just to remind us, you know, because our... That language, you know, the world is very good at, at robbing, at stealing the language of the church, emptying it out of Christ and the divine truth that it is because they cannot see it, and yet confuse. So the, the world we live in is a very spiritual world. They're very good at, at using language purpose and, and create dreams and fulfillments and, and to create a better you and a better this and a better that and a career and all of this. But here, this fruit is that fruit that abides for eternity. This isn't a fruit that it is of my making, of my choosing, nor of my dreaming. This is a fruit that it is of the defining of God, the production, the doing of God. And it, it surpasses us. It, it's... Um, Every time I think of things that can surpass me, I think of the scriptures and I remember in the book of Acts, right, the suddenly of God. There was suddenly this sound, right? And, and if you look, the, the gospel of Mark, which is the most fast paced, right? This is for, the gospel of Mark is perfect for our, our younger generation, right? Multitasking, so much going on all at once. That's the gospel of Mark. Happen, suddenly, suddenly all this is happening. And it's the suddenlies of God. You know, there was this man being baptized in the River Jordan. And then suddenly the heavens were torn asunder and a voice said, This is my son in whom I am well pleased. There's always this sudden. At the Garden of Gethsemane, there's a suddenly happening. Suddenly, Judas shows up with the soldiers and he kisses Christ. But those are the suddenlies to us, not to God. He's not caught. In the midst of the suddenly. 
He is our sudden rock. He is our sure standing. And we all know these moments. We need to, to trust in the provision of these moments. We need to not just let them go, brothers and sisters. We need to, to hold on to it with every strength, everything that God has given us to hold on with. Not because we can, but precisely because what he is telling us, what he is assuring us, he's saying, not only will the Father take away, he says, in every branch that does not bear fruit, he takes away in every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes and that it may bear more fruit. But already you are clean. This is the language of the Lord unto his chosen. Already you are clean. I mean, uh, to me this, this section is beautiful because beginning on chapter 14, on the previous page, he says, let not your hearts be troubled. Think of it, brothers and sisters. He has just washed their feet. The crucifixion is before him. His soul is troubled to the point of death. And he's saying, let not your hearts be troubled. That place that Proverbs tells us that the issues of life flows from. That place that the world is so crafty and cunning. Satan is so intent and is bent towards it. That place, your heart, my heart. We live in the present age. We see it everywhere we go. Right, The marketing system, the world system knows very well how to reach the heart of the husband. The heart of the wife. The father, the mother, the child, the infant. I mean, you see it. Everything in our culture is, is getting them the younger, the better. The quicker we can in, get in there and pervert and twist and make it seem natural. And they're very good at it. But Jesus says, let not your and this is what's amazing that he says, believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare for you a place? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. I will take you to myself. As Earl Bell read from Ezekiel, this is a work of God. I'm going to do this. I'm coming after you. I'm choosing you. I'm laying hold of you. That where I am, you may also be to the Christian there is no other glorious thing to hear it's not that place where the world told me I had to be it's not the bottom of the pit it's not the desire to eat of the pig the husk of the pigs that the prodigal son had that's not it where I am that's what he tells us our lives may be full of confusion but we need to trust in the fact that what God has said it, he has done it. And here we're seeing Christ assure these things. I will come and take you to myself that where I am you also be. And you know the way to where I'm going. This is the part that really, he tells them, you know the way. But we hear Thomas saying, Lord, how can we know the way? And, and these are the things that we need to, to remember. There are things that have been given to us. There are promises. This is the word of God. We have, right, the 60, we have all of this, these 66 books. We have the wealth of church history. We have all these things that God has given to us. But it's not based on how much learning. It's not based on how much conquering I have done. It's based on what he has said. And he says, that you know this. This has been given to you. Trust in me. I am the way, the truth, and the light. And here in chapter 15, he's picking up that same language. I am the vine. Abide in me. This isn't something that's up for us for discussion. This is something for us to rest in. And this is the thing that we have to constantly pull one another back. Lay hold of your brother and sister. And pull each other Hold one another. Trust in the provision of the Spirit. And call one another to this fact. We can abide in Him. Because He says so. He says it. Not me. Not history. He says it. Abide in me. You are clean. Because of the word I have spoken to you. 
I mean, this is things, these are truths that we have to constantly remember. Think of brothers and sisters. He tells them, you are clean. We know what's to come. Denial. Betrayal. The dispersed. They're going to leave them utterly alone. We know the men are going to call the women crazy just then. Right? They're, they're calling. They're not going to believe. Their hearts are going to be slow. We know the, 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 the two disciples, Cleopas and the unnamed disciple, walking in the, to Emmaus. Christ is going to walk with them, and yet they're going to be blind to the fact until their eyes are opened. We know these truths, and yet he's saying, you are clean. So our focus needs not to be on our failures. Our focus needs to be in his true conquering word. And out of that, walk. Out of that, forgive. The fruits of the Spirit, right? That, not the fruits. We have a tendency. The fruit. Right? Because the, the works of the flesh are evident. We don't need anybody to tell us that. And we don't need to look anywhere else for it. Neither over our shoulders. We just have to look within. And you see it there. Ever pushing, ever struggling, ever wanting, ever desiring. Right? Even there I say planning. It's there. But yet, the fruit is. This is what we need to be told. The fruit of the Spirit is. And these are the things that abide. Love, joy. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. I, I'm, not a, I, I'm, I'm not a very gentle man. <laughs> and yet he says, this is a fruit. This is a, 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 a part. I, I can be gentle. You know, I tell my wife all the time, I thank God. I had the privilege one time to have six boys, three of my boys and three of John Paul's boys in my house. And I just said, Lord, I thank you for giving me three daughters. <laughs> it just softens up the house a little bit. You know? I mean, the boys were, it was intense. I, I had no place on the table. It's like, and, and, you know, and I, and I saw my wife taking care of the boys. And I'm like, well, where's my plate? And I remember, I was like, you know, I might be the king, but the prince, they came from the queen. So she has a tendency to care more for them. But yet he says we can be gentle. The world doesn't understand this. The world cannot understand this. For they do not know the spirit nor have him. And they cannot know him. But yet this is the truth of the Christian. We can bear a fruit that bears unto eternal life. This is glorious news, saints. This is assured in him. And as we turn to him, he says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. This world is very good at telling us all the good things that we can do. It teaches us to do them. Right? You do something good, put your name to it. And to, I mean, this is right, to, to build it and become proud of the family name, of the things that we've conquered. But he's saying that unless we abide in him, we cannot do anything. This is a hard saying. I, I, to me, I, I believe this is as hard when I hear this. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He began by saying, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Once you have a clear sight of who God is, once you begin to understand the revelation that God has given to us in the person of the Son, then you can begin to know who you are. Then you can begin to know, but not by my measurements, not by my standards. He's telling us very good, I am the vine, you are the branches. And he's not telling this to a confused world. He's telling this to his disciples. And if we say we don't have a tendency to forget this, we deceive ourselves. 
Because we can get caught up in our good deeds. We can get caught up in the applause and in the things that we do well. And we do certain things well. Like, I thank God. I know from the pit he has redeemed me from. And I know the grace that he has given to me and entrusted in my life to take care of the life of three young women and three young men and one wife. And there are days that are better than others. And I can very easily, on those days that are better, get puffed up. Say, look, I did right. So I'm saying, thanks be to God for laying his hand upon me his pierced hands and holding me so close. And if that wasn't, that would be enough, wouldn't it, brothers and sisters, to know that Christ has laid his hand upon you. But then he says, I will not leave you as orphans. And the promise, because here, this is the wealth of this. This is so much that he gives that you cannot do this. And here is going to be the promise of the Spirit. And if that is not enough, Christ is laying a hold of you. Now think of it. The Holy Spirit is given to indwell you. And the Holy Spirit is no less God than the Father and the Son. He is God indwelling in you. Not because you have thought of this like a really cool Star Wars event type of thing. Came up with your own idea of, you know, studying some weird things. This is God revealing in time and history. This is his will for his people, for his church. To indwell them fully, unashamedly on his part. He's not ashamed of us. He wills. There was something in the liturgy today that was in the reading I talked about him not wanting to do any harm to us. We, 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 I keep thinking about my children, I, you know, and when I correct them, and Tiffany's here, and she knows this, I say this to her all the time, in the midst of correction, we, the lies creep in. My dad doesn't love me. Or, oh, he hates me. How can you do this? How can you say this? And yet, the reason why we correct and admonish our children in the Lord and one another is precisely because we want their good. But yet that lie, right, that, that craftiness of Satan comes in. And yes, maybe sometimes we need to be more gentle as the Spirit is doing in us, and, but, but we make a mess of things. But nevertheless, we desire good but the enemy, the world, our flesh is very good at, at twisting that and causing lies and temptations to enter into our hearts and our thoughts where we think that the one that wills good to us doesn't. We saw that in the garden. Did God really say, surely you will not die? And then we see that in the life of Christ. Are you the son of God? He asks. Attempting, the, the, the tempter, that's, he's attempting to, to lay in you that doubt. Is God keeping something from me? Does God mean harm? Now, we say, we will never think that. We won't, we're Christians, we don't think that. Eve. In the garden. There in the garden of God's delight. The crafty one. Was able to bring that in. And we don't think that. That wouldn't come in today in us. If it was not. For the Holy Spirit indwelling us. If it was not for the, the, the word. Constantly within us. If it was not by these means and graces. That God has given to us. What would be of us? This is something we have to remember, brothers and sisters, because that lying, that deception will creep in, but God means to do us good. Not sometimes. Not most of the time. But all the time. And we cannot allow ourselves to, to, 
to be caught up in anything else other than the Lord himself. And out of that source, out of that fullness of life, out of that overflow into all that he has stored. And Christ is telling I am the vine. Abide in me. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch. And one thing, I, before I move on, and I just wanted to, to really, this nothing, right? For me, apart from me, you can do nothing. And the harshness of that, because he, he uses the imagery of the, the branch that is cut from him, cast aside, and it withers and it dies. We don't want to admit that. I mean, we were born again. We who are washed and cleansed by blood, we can admit it. But the truth is, it, this is a fact that needs to be constantly kind of stamped before our eyes. Because anything that we do that is apart from him, does not draw from the life that he is. And this withering and dying, I remember reading in church history, the, um, one of the church talks about the incurvatum, the, the growing into self, right? So when man, the, the language of the Psalms is beautiful. It talks, it's always open, outward, right? Out in the field, you're out in openness when you're coming before God. And the language of man in sin is inward. He's looking in, he's turning in. And I think it was Athanasius says that when you begin to turn in, you turn, return to the nothingness that you were. And, and in, when you see this image, I mean, my background is in landscaping. I enjoy pruning. And that's what you see, right? You prune a few branches. You leave them aside. They might look pretty for a moment. But as soon as the scorching sun hits it, and even if the scorching sun does not hit it, give it time. You can leave it in the shade. That branch will wither, will die. And it would be good for only one thing, to be burned. And, and this is the tragedy of it. It's, not, it's everything that we do outside of Christ. If we attempt to, to do anything in our own strength, it is drawing from a strength that does not lead into eternal life, that does not lead into the goodness and glory of God. And if it does that, it's separated from him. It withers and it dies and returns to nothing. But in Christ, man is opened up. Not to be man as he would be, but to be a child of God as God would have it so. I mean, th think of when we were remembering the, the fruit of the Spirit. right? This love that is not abstract, but this love that is costly. We will, see, I don't know how, and Pastor James can correct me after if this is heretical or not. Uh, <laughs> but when we look, we know that the sun, right, the air, the, the, the process, the light of the sun is what gives life to our planet, to earth. Right? And the Bible says that when we're there, there's not going to be need for the sun. We won't need the, the light of the sun. There won't be a temple. The Lord himself will be there. And none of us will bear any of the marks of our sin. This, is, this will be glorious. No eye has seen, no ears have heard. So we can only scratch at this. But none of us will bear the marks of our sin. But yet our Lord, for eternity to come, and eternity to come won't be enough, He will bear the marks in His hands, in His feet, and in His side. And all of eternity will not be enough to comprehend the wealth and the riches of his love that is not abstract but very real. Think of it when he lays that crown upon our heads. I, I wonder, will I look and see the, the wound in his hand? So I have in me that somehow all of that will be sustained by those very marks that are on his body. Somehow that is the glory that is reserved for Christ alone. He's, he's going to sit on that judgment seat and he yet bears the mark of our sin and of his love towards us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, not anyone of my choosing, whosoever will believe in him will not perish. Think of that. Will not wither and die. And 
And this is eternal life, that you may know God. Think of it, brothers and sisters. We don't anticipate, we don't, you know, I know there's some there that anticipate this rapture and all this kind of crazy stuff. No, we are a raptured people in the sense that we are constantly walking upon the face of the earth, taken by God. When we begin to look to our left, we say, Lord, forgive me. I will look to you, my Lord. When we begin to look to our right, we won't. We will turn and look to him. We won't just look up for the sake of looking up because it makes us feel good. We will look up because from there comes our salvation. We will hope in him. We will trust in him. Why? Because we get to abide in him. And this is the thing that is amazing. He hasn't, you know, made us clean like what he's telling here i am the vine if anyone does not abide me he is thrown away like a branch and withers and the branches are gathered thrown into the fire burn if you abide in me and my words abide in you ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you this is not a it, this is what can be done we can walk in him and now think of it we so endued with power from on high so filled with the holy spirit bearing his fruit do you think we're going to ask anything that is outside of his glorious will? You think we're going to, and, and this is, you know, in, in writing some things, I, I wrote a question just to myself. And I'm still got to think this through. You know, I said, as a child, do I ask my father what is forbidden or that which he makes me aware his will to be? Because usually we want to ask permission to do that very thing. <laughs> that we know our parents don't approve of. And when there is so much that our Heavenly Father approves of, and we know it, we're not confused about it. We have the Word of God. Amen? This isn't something that, oh, maybe does God, we don't need to be on the fence. We're given His will. And this is where our prayer lies. It's beautiful. You know, I know we, we, we may take this for granted when we respond in prayer and we say with the prayer that he has taught us and we declare and we say the Lord's Prayer. I mean, John, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said that the entirety of the Psalter, all the Psalms, can be organized under the Lord's Prayer. And it's beautiful. You find that and you start reading, every petition fits it. So in the prayer of the Lord, in the Lord's Prayer, and in the prayer of the Psalms, we're taught and we're given to pray, not just the Word of God, but our genuine prayer and plea to God. And this, this is what He's inviting us to, to abide in Him, but there is this, this truth that those that do not abide in Him, there's a true end for it. There is a judgment that's the entirety of the it's the fullness of the gospel we don't just say the parts that really uplift us we say the parts that warn us and what Paul is he warns Galatians he says to them very clearly that whoever practices these things will not inherit the kingdom of God this is for the young and the old alike in the body of Christ. Whoever practices these things, those things that are evident to the flesh, have no place in him. But he has come to give us this place and to make it clear and to cause us to abide in him and be full of him and truly live out this life of glorious praise to our Lord. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified. That you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. By this. Now, so the next time that you must forgive another, that is the moment that the Father will be glorified. See, because I, I have a, an easy, we can... Think very easily how to glorify God. Yeah, I'm going to go. I'm going to do this. I'm going to pass the test. I'm going to conquer this job. I'm going to be a good this. I'm going to be a good that. But then you have these moments where that, the fruit of the Spirit, right? The manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit. Forgiveness. Self-control. Uh, these things that are going to go against the workings of the flesh. And it is precisely, and I, and I keep 
you know, whenever I see the movement of my own home, right, there, there's, mo- the, the, you know, sometimes we're like the Galatians, we're like biting and eating each other, you know, and this whole movement. And then I, sometimes you get this glimpse and you see forgiveness happening and you see understanding, gentleness. Like one day, God willing, you guys will meet my whole family, but the LaBelle's know the Thaddeus and the Lithia. So my two-year-old and my four-year-old. I think they're going to be best friends. I really do, Tiffany. Because they're so at each other's throat <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> Poor Thaddeus, his two-year-old little sister just wails on him. But the other day, I'm watching, I'm looking out. I called Chris. I said, honey, come here and watch this. I'm seeing Thaddeus hold Alithia's hand. And they're walking together to the trampoline. And he's helping her up the steps. I'm like, please, Alithia, don't hit him, don't hit him, don't hit him, don't hit him, you know, this is so good, just keep it in, you know. I didn't go chase for a phone to take a picture of the darn thing, I didn't do any of that. I just, I praised God for that moment. And I said, Lord, write this on their spirit, write this on their hearts, that this is what can happen when we glorify our Heavenly Father. We actually can live the reality of the fruit of the Spirit. We actually can forgive one another. We actually can be gentle. We can be self-controlled, not in because the self is our source, because the great I am is. That is good news, brothers and sisters, because we're surrounded by chaos and darkness. We really are. We can't sugarcoat it. We can't think, well, but they're so nice. With our lost neighbors, brothers and sisters, family members. Wonder, think of it. That moment of repentance. What glorious gift that is. When a man, when a woman recognize that they have not just sinned against a holy God, but against one who's created in his image and likeness, and they actually want to put things right. What a glorious moment that is. I mean, and I, and I think what a moment that is of, of life. And Jesus is saying, by this my Father is glorified. That you bear, again, not a little bit of fruit. Not some fruit. But much fruit. The more and more... I, Gain, I don't know, it's time in the Lord, right? And I start thinking about these things. That the Holy Spirit working in me can bring about much fruit to the glory and praise of our Heavenly Father. And this is how Jesus said that the world would know us by the love of that we have for one another. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Jesus didn't love them. And think there is a measure to this love, and the measure of it is the Father. And he says, that same love that the Father has bestowed upon the Son, that, that love that is only clear in the Godhead, I don't know how else to to explain, to to try to put this into words. That intimate love of the Father towards the Son. He says that same love, that's how Christ has loved his disciples. That's how Christ loves us. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Abide in my love. No, brothers and sisters, we, we, if you just think of the, the life of those men that are hearing that that day and the things that we know that they had to go through, that they went through. I mean, I keep thinking, just because we read Galatians and we know in Galatia, Paul says that he rebuked Peter. Think of it. Peter heard Jesus say this. Abide in my love. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. I keep, I always wonder, you know, I don't know if I'm going to be able to ask Peter this. Paul rebuked him. And he submitted to the rebuke. 
was new. So I wonder sometimes, you know, in the back of the disciples, how much, because they did. I mean, we know they got together and, and, and they would write, right? John wrote the gospel. They, Peter, by the hand of Mark, that's right, right? They wrote the, the epistles. So they're constantly remembering the words of their Lord. And then they're causing that whole text that says, submit to God, resist the devil, and the devil might flee. No, he will flee. Because we're abiding in that submission that is to God and God alone. But we can't create or, or try to imagine what that submission is going to look like. It's going to be in the hour that you need to trust in the provision of God. That very hour that you don't feel like it. That you don't, it's not in you. And this is the thing that we need to remember. It's not in me. So if I, if I wait a moment that I'm going to start really feeling like I love my brother and sister, well, guess what? <laughs> that might not come. Chances are it won't come in your own strength. But when you abide in him, suddenly there's this thing happening in you. They say, this is not of me. This is outside of me. And yet, it's so in me. And no words can explain. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. And if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. And it's not an if or. It's abiding in his love. You do keep. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. As I think of the hard sayings of Christ, and then as I think of the extent of the truth and the fullness of what he says, he, he's telling them, look, these things I'm, because we hear him before say, I'm speaking these things to you so that when it happens, you'll believe that I am he. And now he says, I'm speaking these things to you that my joy may be in you. Where? When we're in heaven? When we're in the life to come? No. It's, again, it's a high, his high priestly prayer. Father, I don't ask you to remove them from the world, but to keep them in the world, to keep them safe. So where do we need this joy the most? Here and now, in the midst of it all. And not just here and now in the safety of the Lord's day with the saints and worshiping God. In the Monday mornings, Tuesday afternoons, you know, Thursday at 2 o'clock in the morning when your kid won't go to sleep. Those are the hours, I mean, constantly. We need that surety of his joy. We pray for the persecuting church, the church that's suffering and being persecuted. And... Every time I think of the persecuted church, I remember a little book by Richard Wurmbrand that I read, Tortured for the Sake of Christ, for the Love of Christ in Portuguese, a little different. And um, there's this woman, and I always remember her. It was, she had given her life to Christ, and the secret police, they, they, were, they really wanted to hurt her, and they found out that she was a Christian, that she was going to get married. So he says, on the night of her wedding, that's when we're going to go and knock the doors down and just take her away. Because that was right, the desire to come in the night and destroy, annihilate the heart and the emotions of the person. That's the wickedness of it. And yet the precise, so they wait to the wedding night of that woman and there, after they come in, knock the door down, take and they put the chains on her. And what she said, that Wormbrand wrote, shook me to the core. She looked at the chains and said, these are the jewels my Lord has gifted me with. So it's amazing how we pray for the persecuted church. But when we get to hear the prayers of the suffering in Christ, oh Lord. You know, it's like, I'm almost tempted, Lord, do I need to suffer? Do I need to pray for suffering to pray? I'm like, no, no, Lord. I, you know what's best. I'll just trust in you. But Lord, teach me how to. Do you see how all of a sudden, when we begin to look, we begin to ask the very things that pleases the Father. And now you're asking him to teach you. And he guarantees his joy so that we may be full.
in um, writing, I even, my daughter likes to write poetry, but I, I even began to write a little poem. And this is why it's, it's wonderful to, to, to gain time in the word of God. And in thinking about being the branch that he declares that I am. And it's, I don't know which branch I am. I'm his. I said, Lord, may I truly be satisfied as a branch in thy vine. Lord, this is glorious indeed, that in you I may abide. And you, my Lord divine, make me wholly thine. Bow your heads and pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this moment, Lord, that we can remember the words of our Lord and take every thought and make it captive to Christ. And Lord, my prayer this morning, our prayer this morning, is that by the power of your Holy Spirit, by the truth of your word, you write this in us and cause it to be true. That we may bring much glory to our Heavenly Father by submitting to you, by trusting in your provision, by knowing that you will good, that you are a good God. And all things are in your control. And all things are according to your good pleasure. And they are for the praise of your glorious name. Write this in us. Cause us to live in the wealth and in the richness of the true vine. Christ Jesus our Lord. In him alone we pray.